Good morning, Revive. So I was going to ask people to, to find seats, and I guess they're still coming in. Usually there's about 30 at the back, but there's just a few coming in. I wasn't sure with the weather, uh, the way it was this morning, whether that meant the church would have 150 people or 50 people. It's funny how it works. And sometimes you think, oh, yeah, it's really, you know, if it's really, really nice, you think you want to go out on the boat or something. Still. Let's just bow our heads. Lord, we just thank you for this time that we have together today to, to worship you and lift you up. Just thank you for what you've provided for us, that the grave is not the end, that our last day here is not our last day. We just thank you for that. It just changes how we live, changes how we care for each other, and uh, just changes everything. We just thank you for your love for us and our love for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Cheryl handed me a, a list of announcements, and I'm not sure how many there are. I think there's 12 or 13 announcements. So we'll go through them fairly quickly. Uh, uh, the first one, grief shares here on Tuesday evening, so it's just in the in the hall on the side from seven to nine. So you can speak to myself or Mary, or you can just show up if you're interested. It's uh, every Tuesday evening till uh, into December. Um, Wednesday prayer time at ANC at Paul Street. It says postponed, but that's a lie. <laughs> It's actually on. So just so you know, if you're wanting to go, it's it's on. Uh, third one, the busyness of a Bible study is here Wednesday evening. It's Dave and Cheryl looking after that. It's 7 to 8.30 p.m. and everyone's welcome. So it's not uh, like specifically for women or men or it's everyone. Uh, the fourth one, change conference for teens. So it's this Friday and Saturday, and apparently there are still a few limited spots left. So you have to talk to Rebecca Goulet if you're interested. And they're also looking for volunteers and greeters, ushers, bag checking, prayer team, etc. So that would be uh, people other than the participants, right? So adults, anyone can do that. So if you're interested, talk to Rebecca Goulet today as well. Uh, the next youth night at Kin is November 3rd, 7.30 to 10. And then this was announced last week as well, but there's a hip hop dance workshop November 1st at 6 p.m. and that's at the high school uh, in the GDHS gym. So the proceeds from that will be going to uh, McCallum's for their work in Africa. Uh, women's Night Out this Thursday, 7 to 9, and it's across the street of the Fountain Building or the Kin, whichever uh, group you want to attribute it to. And then number 9, it's... We have a few things. Okay. God has plans for revive is what I have here, but anyway, that's Children's Church. So, yeah, just so you know the ages, Children's Church is grade four and younger, and the PDJF is grades five to eight. And they'll be dismissed later after the call to worship. Um, do, you, uh, do you have any more slides, or am I just reading ones here? Okay. So, God has plans for Revive. He's calling you to be part of it and begin by committing to pray. So pray for Mark Willick as he prepares to be our pastor in March 24. Cheryl Fast as she steps into the women's senior ministry. And she's already stepping into it. And the forming of the search committee and wisdom for Revive as she seeks a new shepherd. And the family of Revive as she leans into and depends upon her one truth. And then uh, we're in a month of prayer as well for the selection 
process of new elders and deacons. So uh, it's important that when you're praying, you also refer to the scriptures that are listed in the protocol that uh, we have been given in the Bible to help us uh, discern who should be elders and who should be deacons. And if you are given any suggestions, you can bring them to the deacons or elders during that time period as well. And Karen Share this Saturday and it's a potluck and it's a fast. So if you need any information, talk to Dave or Cheryl fast. So Cheryl's right here. So. And there's also going to be prayer at the front of the church after service. So anyone that would like to have personal prayer at the front, there will be someone up here to pray with you. And I think, oh, there's one more thing. Almost forgot. So Catherine brought a bunch of, of uh, the Samaritan's Purse shoebox at the back, and you're familiar with that. It's been going on for quite a number of years. And uh, they can explain it to you at the back. They have, uh, you know, uh, they have the boxes and they have pamphlets that tell you what to put in the box or what not to put in the box. And uh, there's also uh, a, a pamphlet for explaining things to pray for as well. So that's always fun for families to put together and to share with the less privileged around the world. And I think that's it for announcements. So we'll hand it over to our very exciting and excited worship team. It's a joy when we get to be gathered in body, too. That's once a week, so it's good to be gathered with you. Um, I know we haven't done the prayer requests yet, but it's been really heavy on my heart. Um, the pain that Zarina is in in her body. And um, so I chose songs today that have to do with Jesus being our friend, Christ as the cornerstone, and how great God is. So even though they're joyful songs to me, they're, they're us reminding ourselves of the bigness of God in light of uh, the pain. And I know Serena is not the only one in pain in our congregation. So uh, maybe as we sing this, we can also keep in mind um, upholding the tension between the reality of our lives but the goodness of God being bigger than. So I invite you to stand and take a moment here with this this first slide before we start singing it and just say god may our worship come out of a space of true vulnerability and trust in you we have nothing but you we come with what little faith we have and we ask you to multiply it today multiply our faith help us to lean into you more to trust your goodness you are our friend you are for us, not against us. And we come today gathering our bodies, our hearts, and our souls, our spirits to worship and remind ourselves that you are our cornerstone. You're big, and that's what we're going to talk about today. How big is our God? How great you are. Give us faith when something wavers. And you hold Zarina and all those people who are feeling tension in their bodies today. We don't ignore those pains. You know them and you are familiar with them. We just trust ourselves to you. Show us the way. Yes, Lord.
was teaching at way back when we were at the little church in the in the school, and he took out this big long rope and he showed us this is your life. And then he showed us this big long piece. We're just seeing a little piece. And God, we declare, you're good. We only see this little piece of life. And hear the big fullness of life. So we can say you're good, even though we don't see the end of the story yet. We know you're good.
lift this beautiful worship to you, Lord. It just, it just read like a song, a classic song, a of songs, where it started out with some melancholy and some bittersweet and just ended with pure and beautiful praise for you, Lord, no matter what situation we are in. We just thank you for the worship today. We just thank you for you being you. In Jesus' name we pray. Good morning. As I was preparing this morning for the call to worship, um, this phrase came to mind, you reap what you sow. It's a small phrase tucked in amongst a bunch of verses in Galatians 6, verses 7 to 9. A man reaps what he sows. I'll read the rest of the verses a little later. As I've thought of this verse in the past, I have often just kind of more focused on what you reap, the part that you get, and less on the sowing part, the part that you put out. In reality, they end up being the same, but my focus had been more on the reaping part. And as I thought about this, I thought of gardeners, and I don't know if you know an avid gardener, but late fall, early winter, out come the catalogs, and they start pouring over those, looking for the right varieties, the best seeds. They'll prepare their garden in the fall for the winter, and then early in the spring, they're back out there getting the soil ready for those sows and seeds they want to sow. Um, a lot of thought goes into it. So I was thinking, well, how much thought am I putting into what I'm sowing? And as I thought about that, I was reminded of this story that took place in my life years ago, before I married Dave. I was having a conversation with this lady, and it was about forgiveness. And we were talking, you know, encouraging each other to keep a short record of wrongs kind of thing and to forgive. And in that conversation, it came to mind that I was holding back forgiving someone. And she asked me, are you ready to forgive? And I said, yeah, but... And you can't really truly forgive if there's a but in there. <laughs> so I said, but I know he's going to hurt me again because this individual had hurt me several times. And she looked me straight in the eye and said, then you need to forgive him again. And it was like a veil was removed from my eyes and I was able to forgive him that day. I can't go into tons of details because I'm short on time, but. I would love to share the whole story with you guys after if somebody's interested. Um, so I was able to forgive him that day. But I also made a decision that day to sow seeds of love and kindness in his life. So I'm going to go back and read the whole passage from Galatians 6, 7 to 9. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers. I didn't mention this individual that I had been hurt by several times was an extremely godly man. So he was one who belonged to the family of believers. And it says to do good to all, not just to those that show kindness to us, but to all. So it was the Holy Spirit at work that day that helped me sow the right seeds because I could have chosen unforgiveness. I could have chosen to forgive, but then put up a wall and say, I'm just gonna, ex I'll just exchange pleasantries and I won't go deeper than that. I'm amazed at the relationship I have with this person today. Um, I was, I struggled when I was thinking about this, whether I should share who the person was because they were, they are a very godly person. And, um, and then when I was working on this, I got a phone call from them. And I thought, I am going to share. That person who hurt me was my father-in-law. He wasn't my father-in-law at the time. I wasn't his choice for his son. 
and there's cultural stuff and all of that. But when I picked up the phone this week, I, Dave was right beside me, and I said, Dave's right here. I can pass the phone to him. He said, no, that's okay. I can talk to you because you are my child. And I would never have had that relationship with him, the second father in my life, if I had chose to put that wall there. But because I chose, I believe by the Holy Spirit's prompting, to sow love and kindness, I have an amazing relationship with him today. So my challenge for all of us this morning is to take time to think about what kind of seeds we are sowing. Let me pray for us. Father God, I just thank you for your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be the one that helps us to see what kind of seeds we are sowing and help us to choose the right ones to sow. I pray for patience for those that sow those seeds over and over and over again, and yet they wait for that harvest. Sometimes they spring up fast and we get it soon, but sometimes we wait years for that, Lord. So help us to be patient as the harvest grows. And help us to be diligent to, to pull out the weeds where they pop up and to continue to sow those seeds. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Did Cheryl take the... Oh, here it is. Sorry, I looked a little lost without my mic. Um, yeah, we'll dismiss the kids for school, and either Sunday school and PBJM, and I guess that oh, there goes half the church. <laughs> So let's just bow our heads together in prayer. I'm just going to uh, read some prayer requests, and uh, we can just pray as we go along, as you listen to the to uh, what I read. If uh, anything sits with you, especially, you can just kind of lift that up to the Lord. First, uh, Janine is asking for prayers for herself because. Her foster dad, Larry, passed away this Wednesday. And then please pray for Brenda because she has a bad cold. And as Vivian stated earlier, we're praying for Serena. She's uh, in a bad place health-wise right now. And uh, we just pray for better days ahead. And at the same time, we'll let Lift up Neil McCrimmon as well, who's in the Maxwell Manor and is also uh, in a very low place for his health. On a happier note, we'll pray for Hannah's upcoming wedding. And we want you to join us as we said earlier, help us to find the pastor that you have for us. Give us vision and understanding of your plan for us. Anna, uh, she's had trouble with her hip, uh, having physio, so we'll just pray for that, the continued healing of her hip. Uh, Melina, Anna's daughter, is asking for prayer for her exams and uh, her class that she's uh, taking at university, just that she has clarity and understanding as she uh, works through this class and also enthusiasm to learn. And we want to praise God because Pat is getting out of the hospital tomorrow. Now Pat would be a friend of Catherine's, so we do have a praise report. Lord, we just thank you for these people that have, have uh, brought forth their requests, and we just lift their requests and we lift these people as well up to you. Once again, I'll just say we thank you for your love for us and our love for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now it's my uh, privilege to introduce the speaker today because Pastor Bruce is away. We've had somebody that uh, has been in our congregation on and off for quite a while now, and he's managed to maintain a little bit of anonymity, but that's all done now. Yeah. <laughs> we found him. So, Pastor Dave Smith is an ordained minister in the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Canada. He's pastored churches in Alberta, Quebec, and Ontario. And Dave has also held leadership roles in Power to Change, Outreach Canada, and Freedom in Christ. So Dave has retired and is enjoying working two days a week at Home Depot. And he's married to Barbara Smith, and they have nine children and nine grandchildren. I knew all the other stuff, but the nine children, congratulations. <laughs> Dave and Barbell are now living in Green Valley. So I welcome Dave Smith to the front to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Get used to my clicker here. Well, how big is your God, is my question and the title this morning, because my God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. So let's stand on our feet and let's kind of affirm that basic principle that we teach to our kids. So we're going to do this twice, and the first time will be just kind of a warm-up. And then the second time is, uh, that's the time when we really put it out our very best, okay? We want those kids to hear the adults uh, believe this too, right? So, we'll do the first go around. Are we ready? My God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Okay, now here we go. Ready? One, two, three. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. Please be seated. That's something to practice on your way home from church or at the lunch table today. You know, we teach this important truth to our kids. But do we really believe it ourselves? Do we really allow it to sink in and permeate our being and what we truly, truly believe? Because sometimes we also need to be reminded. And so I want to consider this morning together, how big is your God? Because whether we realize it or not, the quality of our life and our faith will be directly proportionate to the size of our God. Most people suffer, in fact, from a small view of God. So a few, there was a movie back a few years ago, some of you may remember, it was called Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And the kids were really a normal size, but they got shrunk down. And the sad truth is that if most people's lives were made into a movie, the sad truth is that many of us have accidentally shrunk God down. When we wake up in the morning to a small view of God, you're going to live in a constant fate of fear and anxiety because everything depends upon you. Your mood is going to be determined by your circumstances. You're not going to be able to give generously because your financial security depends upon you. When given the chance to share your faith, you're going to shirk back because you're not able to trust the Holy Spirit to give you the words or confidence once again, because it all depends upon you. In fact, when human beings shrink God, it results in fear, results in retreat, it results in loss of vision, and a failure to persevere. A day with a shrinking God can turn into a week and very easily into a year, and in some sad cases, into a lifetime. And then we can wake up one day and wish that we could have accomplished so much more in our life, because of a faulty view that we've had all along. Is your God a shrunken God? Is he a big God? Is he as big as the God in the Bible? Is he as big as Jesus? 
When we use this, because I don't know of another passage in the Bible that magnifies Jesus more than Colossians 1, 15 to 20. Now, when we use that term magnifying God, I just want to clarify something up front that when we talk about magnifying God in the Christian context, we're not talking about magnifying God in the sense of a, mag, of, of a uh, microscope where we look at something really small and we try to blow it up. But rather it's as though we look through a telescope and we see only a small bit and we want to blow up what we can and to, so, to, so we can grasp the greatness and the bigness and the, and the vastness and the mightiness and the strength and the power of God himself. Let us magnify the Lord in these passages in Colossians. And I'd invite you to read along with me this morning. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things have to be together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him, to reconcile himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Consider for a moment what this passage says about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. We see right off the get-go that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, The glory of Christ, who is the likeness of Christ. In Hebrews 1.3, we're reminded that the Son reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. That Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. I'd like to quote a, uh, a passage from a book entitled The Pleasures of God by my favorite theologian and pastor, John Piper. And he recounts this story. He says, a memory is fresh in my mind that makes the radiance of God's Son very real. Our staff took a two-day retreat for prayer and planning. The retreat center was a former mansion, now made into simple, uh, simple accommodations by the Mary Hill sisters for people who want to seek God. Our second day there, I got up early and took my Bible to the garden porch, a glassed-in nook in the house overlooking a steep drop-off and the Mississippi River to the east. The sun was not yet up, but there was light. My appointed reading for that morning was Psalm 3.1, which read, Lord, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. And as I pondered this, the red pinpoint of the sun pierced the horizon straight in front of me. It startled me because I hadn't realized I was facing east. I watched for a moment as this pinpoint became a fingernail of fire. Then I read on, Arise, O Lord, and I looked up to see the whole red gold ball blazing just over the river. Within moments, there was no more looking at it without going blind. The higher it rose, the brighter it got. I thought of John's vision of Christ in Revelation when he said his face was like the shining sun full of strength, verse, chapter 1, verse 16. My glimpse that morning lasted maybe five minutes before the strength of the rising sun turned my face away. Who can look upon the sun shining in full strength? And the answer to that is God can the radiance of the sun's face shines first and foremost for the enjoyment of his father. This is the son whom I love. He is my pleasure. You must fall on your face and turn away. But I behold the sun and his radiance every day with love and never fading joy. I thought to myself, surely this is one thing implied in John 17, 26. 
For that day is coming when I'll have the capacity to delight in the Son the way the Father does. My fragile eyes will get the power to take in the glory of the Son, shining in his full strength, just the way the Father does. The pleasure of God has in his Son will become my pleasure, and I will not be consumed, but enthralled forever. End of quote. And I ask you today, how big is Jesus? Because Jesus, we learn, is the radiance of God's glory. He is the image of the invisible God, the God that no one had ever seen before. In fact, when you look at Jesus, the Bible tells us you have seen God. And Paul goes on to tell us that he is the invisible image of God, the firstborn over all creation. When Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, he doesn't mean that Jesus was created himself. He used the word prototikos, which is the word we get our word prototype from. It was the title of preeminence. It means that Jesus is the Lord of creation. He stands preeminently over his creation. And we see that again in the following verse. It says, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. That Christ is the supreme over all things, all powers, all rulers, all authorities. And all things were created by him and for his own glory. I love the word of A.B. Simpson, the founder of the Christian Missionary Alliance, when he said, Christ is the author and end of creation. All the glory of nature is, is but a reflection of his own glory. The Father revealed in the Son, the Son is revealed in the majesty of nature. The shining heavens and verdant earth are but the mirror of his attributes and the works of his hands. Friends, there's no higher purpose in life than glorifying God than by delighting in his Son. Colossians 1.17 reminds us he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So how big is Jesus? He is the sustainer of all things. In him, all things hold together. And Paul here uses the perfect tense, which indicates continuous action in the Greek, meaning that in Jesus, all things are continuously held together by God. He didn't just put creation into being and then let it go. He is the sustainer and the creator right now. He is the one who causes the sun to keep on shining. He's the one who causes gravity to keep us all in place. If he stopped sustaining, everything would fall apart. Every moment that you and I live is a result of the sustaining grace of Jesus Christ himself. That's how big he is. How big is Jesus? He's, he's big enough to head the church, and he's big enough to conquer death, and he's big enough to be supreme over all things. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. How big is Jesus? He is big enough to have all the fullness of God dwelling in him. Think about that. The Bible says that God is eternal and Jesus is eternal. The, God, the Bible says that, G, that God is all-knowing and Jesus is all-knowing. That God is all-powerful and Jesus is all-powerful. That God created everything and Jesus created that God is perfect and Jesus is perfect. That God is complete and Jesus Christ is complete. For, for God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile himself to all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. How big is Jesus? He's big enough to reconcile all things on heaven and on earth and everywhere. Through the miraculous power of his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. We may never understand the significance and meaning of this verse. Jesus not only reconciled things on earth, on earth, but also in heaven. 
There's this cosmic significance to the finished work of Christ on the cross. And one day we are going to follow him and the dead in Christ are going to rise because of how big Jesus is. He's the image of God, the creator, the Lord of all, the sustainer of life, the conqueror of death. But the question is, will you live with this big God? Will you choose to be a big God person? Will you live as one who believes there is a big God right next to you right now? This came, uh, story kind of uh, resonates with me that uh, when I was in grade four, there was this bully in grade eight. His name was Derek Parsons. He was big. How big was he? He was really, really big. And everybody was afraid of this kid. And for some reason, he just hated me. He threatened my life daily. He forced me to find new and innovative ways to get to school until that final standoff one cold November morning. I walked to school like usual. Derek had emerged from across the street where he was waiting for me. And he, was, he overpowered me and he threw me to the ground. And he had started to unload his fury on me when this big hand grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and yanked him right up into the air. I still remember that total look of horror on his face. <laughs> <laughs> My posture changed as I leapt to my feet. My energy changed as I experienced a surge of adrenaline and confidence. My attitude changed as I reminded him what a serious mistake he made ever messing with me. In just a matter of seconds, my words changed, my attitude changed, my energy changed, my posture changed. In fact, my entire world view changed. But why? Because as a 10 year old, I had the biggest bodyguard in the world. I had Super Dad, and he was so big. But I'll tell you something else, friends. If I were convinced that Super Dad was with me 24 hours a day, I'd have a fundamentally different approach to life than I do. I'd have all kinds of courage and security, but of course he's not. And I can't count on Super Dad because even Super Dad was flesh and blood. And he died just after my 16th birthday. How big is your God? The Bible says he's the one who is greater even than super dad. He's with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He's with you when you wake and when you sleep and when you speak and when you listen and when you work and when you pray and when you worship. So the question is, when you get out of bed each morning, are you going to live with a shrunken God? Or are you going to live like you have a great big God by your side? Let me share a few examples from my own life. There's been many, many stories I could share, but I'll limit it to a couple. When we were back in seminary, we had six kids at that time. We were homeschooling, and we had sold our business prior to that and had used the funds to uh, pay our way through uh, Bible college and seminary. And we we're getting right near the end of the run through seminary. And uh, my wife came to me and said, Dave, we, we just can't sustain this. We're running out of money. And every month we're running a deficit of X number of dollars. I don't remember if it was 300 or $600, but whatever it was, there was, she gave me this exact amount with her accounting brain. And we thought, well, what are we going to do? And I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm into this for the long haul. And if uh, we need to take some time off and go to work and then come back to school, that's, that's fine too. Whatever it takes. And just as she had shared that need, within just a matter of a few days, we began praying about it. And lo and behold, along came a couple named Larry and Suzanne. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about Larry and Suzanne. We'd only met them about three times. The first time I met them, we had a conversation, and they told me that they used to be churchgoers, and they used to attend regularly, and they made a profession of faith in Christ. And somewhere along the line, they wandered and drifted. And they never really found their way back to church. And I assured them that it wasn't too late. Now I invited them out to church, and these folks showed up, 
And uh, like I said, we've, I've only seen them two or three times. And then an amazing thing happened. Larry and Suzanne, they showed up at my door. And they invited themselves in, basically. And they explained this strange story about how when Larry's folks died, they left him an inheritance. And they always felt bad that they never tithed on it or never gave anything back to the Lord when they got their inheritance. And it's always kind of nagged them. And he said that they felt God was telling them that there was a need and to come and see us. And so they came to us and the words out of Larry's mouth was, would you like to receive this money as a lump sum or in monthly installments? And that was a shocking question. That's not like, your, here's your 50 bucks. And we said, well, okay, so what would that be as a monthly installment? Because we have X number of months to go. And we knew we had 12 months or 16 months, whatever the number of months were, we knew exactly what the number of months were. We knew what our shortfall was. And so Larry, being an accountant, calls out his calculator, and he starts punching away, and he said, well, to last for that length of time, would be exactly $600 a month. And it turned out to be the amount was the exact same amount that my wife shared with me just a few days previously. Now that is an amazing story. And I think about that and some might call it a miracle. Could it be explained rationally and humanly? Sure. But it's never happened before, it's never happened again. It happened precisely in that length of time. And how could that be any how could that be explained any way other than God's direct intervention? I was amazed because God is a big God. It's not so surprising, is it? And then when we moved for a pastoral move, we made a move to Ontario from Quebec. And I remember at that time our son. Our youngest one was uh, feeling really, was complaining that he was feeling lethargic and his joints ached and, and whatnot. It took us forever coming to Ontario to find a family doctor. But uh, here he was, age five, and we finally got a, a doctor lined up. We took him in. The doctor said, well, it sounds like it could be a cold or flu, he could be uh, just fatigue going back to school, could be the stress of a new location, could be a lot of different things. But because I don't know him, I'll do a blood work, complete blood work and everything for him. So they did that. And then the very next day, we get a phone call from the doctor's office. And the doctor said, Dave and Barb, I want you guys to drop what you're doing, pack up some overnight clothes, and bring Nathan to the children's sick kids hospital. Wow, that was, that was a little bit disturbing. So we get to the doctor, and the doctor explains to us that uh, it kind of looks like he's got, there's a possibility that he has the signs of cancer at five. So we went to the sick kids' hospital. They did all the diagnosis, all the tests from scratch. And within hours, they affirmed our worst nightmare. And I said, I remember saying to the doctor, do you, uh, is this the time when we ask for a second opinion? And he said, based on where your son's at right now, you don't have time. Because within two weeks, left alone, he'll probably be gone. And you know, through the miracles of modern medicine and a lot of prayer, Nathan just continued to, he went through all those treatments and bone marrow stuff and the chemotherapy, went, lost his hair, went through all, the whole thing. And what a huge traumatic thing it was for our whole family. And then, and they said to us, well, there's two things you've got to really watch for. One of them is that he may have, if he comes through this okay, he may have cognitive problems and bone density issues. And, and so he may, it may affect his growth. So we were, we were concerned. But he went through all those treatments, and he survived his cancer. And after all of that, he survived his cancer. And you know what? We attribute that to the big God that we serve. 
And if that wasn't enough, during one of our last visits there, there was somebody extra in the room, and they said, uh, we're with the Children's Wish Foundation, and we're here to grant Nathan a wish. And we're thinking, wow, that's, that's an amazing... Uh, I've never heard of the Children's Wish Foundation at that point. And they said, oh, yeah, well, we're going to grant him a wish. He can do... And so they explained to Nathan. They get called Nathan over, and they said, Nathan, this is your chance to have a dream come true. You're going to have a wish. And you could... You could go swim with dolphins, or you could meet a famous movie star. You could have a swimming pool at your house. Or we could buy you a Big Mac. And I stood behind my son, and I thought, wow, this is absolutely amazing. Please don't pick the Big Mac. (laughs) (laughs) And here he said his response was, I'd like our whole family to go to Disney World. And uh, they said, okay. He said, well, do you know how big my family is? (laughs) And they said, yeah, we know how big your family is. And we're going to send all of you to Disney World. And, you know, we went to Disney World, Universal Studios. We did the whole gambit and the whole experience. It was first class accommodations, the front of every line. It It was like the most dreamy vacation you could imagine. We rented cars, and, and actually they, did, they arranged all the car rentals. I still remember uh, in Florida landing, and we were met by one of the princesses from Disney at the airport and called out his name. We got to sit at the front of the plane. We, got, we, got, we were just treated so royally, and it was such a huge deal. We got to the front of every line. The kids just uh, had such a good time. The brothers and sisters, who some of which felt a little neglected during that time that Nathan was getting all the attention, was saying, Nathan, you're the best brother ever. (laughs) And, you know, in the midst of all that, here I am as a dad, thinking one day, wouldn't it be great to be able to take my kids to Disney World? And never could afford it. It probably was never not going to happen. And yet, by the grace of God, through the sickness of a five-year-old, what a, what a message and what a beautiful gift of grace and love given to our family. And we couldn't take any credit for it at all. It was all God because we serve a big God. And since then, we continue to seek God with the big and the small decisions and situations in our life over all these years. And God never fails. And I'll tell you, some of my own story to tell you that we haven't arrived, that we're in process, in fact, often have more questions than answers, but we're not fretting because we know that our God is a big God. And the most significant question on my heart right now is, how big is your God? Or put another way, will you serve and live a big, a big God in a big God church and be good big God people? Are we willing to ask God for your needs as individuals and as a congregation that all the needs of this church and all the needs in our community, the, all the needs in each family are represented here today, all the needs in your own personal life, are you willing to commit those to the, to the big God. You know, the past is already written, the present is full of challenges and questions, and the future is yet to be written. But here's what we do know with 100% certainty, that our God is a big God, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we know, based on the authority of God's word, that he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him all things were created, Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood 
shed on a cross. And I know there's some here today with heavy hearts and heavy bur burdens. And some of you have big decisions and health issues and financial decisions and uncertainty and deep hurts and worries as we've heard in some of the prayer requests even today. But God sent me here today to tell you that you're going to be okay because your God is so big and so strong and so mighty and there's nothing your God cannot do. So please stand for a word of prayer and we'll close. Our benediction today is taken from Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 16 to 19. And I pray this as a blessing upon you today. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it is too great to understand fully, then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.